Most beef animals, when they are harvested, are dying of organ failure, particularly their livers. They pump gases into the packaging. If your packaged meat looks bright red, then it is filled with artificial gases to create that. Like, no one knows that. Holy moly. It would be pathologically dangerous. Dead soil, dead plants, and about to be dead people. David and I got married and we were told very quickly that we probably would not be able to have children because I had other health issues just aside from that that I've struggled with for years that I just thought was normal. You're shortchanging yourself, you're shortchanging your own health, maybe your ability to have a family, your energy levels, you're shorting yourself on all those things to save a couple dollars. I always get a laugh like vegetarian fed hens. Chickens were not meant to be vegetarians, just metabolically they need a certain amount of animal protein in their diet. The water cycle is broken. I mean, you can go to places in Iowa where you can't drink the water, it'll turn children blue and they'll suffocate. And more topsoil erodes away into either the ocean, the rivers, or our aquifers, which then poison all of the above. Stop exposing yourself to these chemicals or you will die. You are going to kill yourself if you're doing this. I recently visited one of my local farms here in Missouri to get the scoop on what's going on behind the scenes within the beef and chicken industry, as well as the agricultural industry. This particular farm that I visited, fed from the farm, is actually the farm I've been ordering the majority of my food from for these last few years. So it was a really neat experience to go and see the operation, see the animals, talk to the person who's been nourishing my body. I mean, the majority of my health is coming from this farm. Now, to be honest, when farmer David and I first started recording, we were having a little bit of technical difficulties with the microphone and audio. So I'm just gonna quickly regurgitate some of the really important things that I thought David said, which is that contrary to what most people would think, pasture-raised chickens actually help restore the soil and rejuvenate the land. As chickens forage and roam around the pastures, they naturally deposit manure Manure, and their manure is rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So when chicken manure is spread out across the pastures, it acts as a natural fertilizer, enriching the soil with these essential nutrients. And when chickens peck and scratch at the ground to find bugs and insects, their scratching and digging loosens up the soil, which can then prevent the soil from becoming too compact and helps promote the circulation of air and water down into the soil, which can help with beneficial soil organisms and the plant roots. This is actually a drone shot image of David's farm. And you can see a very vivid strip where the chickens grazed and regenerated the soil. I thought that was really neat. Now let's jump into the conversation. Your guys' chicken process is much different than other ones because you guys are having them roam the pastures. Now they do have some corn and soy and grains. Uh, Non-GMO, but yep, yep, they get do get some non-GMO grains. Because most chickens, even if they're pasture raised, have to have some. They all do, because a chicken's an omnivore, so it's designed to eat a balance. Uh, they actually, a chicken's the only animal God gave a feed meal to. They actually have a special organ called a gizzard and they swallow rocks and it's literally a grain mill. And so anytime they eat a seed or a grain, it goes in there and it grinds it down into fine particles so that they can digest it. So a chicken is literally the only animal, uh, I guess there's some other fowl that have a gizzard, but the only type of animal that the good Lord saw fit to give them a grain mill. And so they're designed to handle some grains, but they also need pasture, they need a diversity. Um, and they're also designed, I always get a laugh, like vegetarian fed hens. Chickens were not meant to be vegetarians, just metabolically they need a certain amount of animal protein in their diet or they really have a lot of issues. And so um, with ours, they get that from insects and other little small creatures that they uh, feast upon when they're out and about in the pastures. But if you deprive them of that, it, it's kind of like uh, huh, people that are sugar. deprived of that, right? You know, you can always tell the vegetarian in the marathon, right? You know, he stands out. <laughs> So, you know, I had read that in the last 60 years, chickens, they have become 364% bigger. So they were much smaller 60 years ago, and now because of just the way that we feed them, that they become so much larger. Yeah, feeding and breeding. These laying hens are actually probably a little smaller than hens would have been um, 50 or 60 years ago. Meat chickens definitely are larger, and then certain breeds can be even larger still. The laying hens, you could, you know, process them for meat, but there's just not very much on them because they're designed, um, they, they lay more eggs and lay down meat. Oh, and okay. so it depends on the breed of chicken. But yeah, even our meat chickens live um, a tremendously long time out on pasture. You know, a conventional bird might only live for six weeks and never see the sun its entire life. Those birds, they are in organ failure mode. You know, they're very susceptible to anything and everything um, because all they've done their entire life is just sit in a pile of manure 
and eat water and drink feed. They don't get any exercise. They don't get any fresh air. Um, they don't get any of the other wholesome components that they were designed to have in terms of pasture, in terms of animal protein, any of that kind of stuff. It's just GMO grains and waste grease is the typical ration of a conventional broiler. So our broilers, in contrast, they're going to live somewhere between like nine, ten weeks out on pasture. And when we harvest them, they're incredibly healthy. We have people all the time say, your chicken wings are so big. Your dark meat tastes so good. And it's like, well, it's because it's exercise. Those chickens run around and they do stuff out, out and about. And uh, a conventional bird really couldn't live past seven weeks. It would just fall over dead mm -hmm. from organ failure because it, it's just, it's not a life, you know, it's just an existence. And so. Your eggs uh -huh. are so deep orange. Oh yeah. Gotta love it. Uh, yeah. They look like I put fr like Frank's Red Hot or hot sauce inside of my eggs when I make them. <laughs> oh yeah. You can see and taste the difference with our eggs. So coloration in eggs comes from a couple things. It's primarily diet based though. And so there are um, carotenoids uh, is a fancy name for the pigmentation in grass. Mm -hmm. And so they eat a tremendous amount of forage. So that darkens up their eggs. And then even in the non-GMO ration we give them, we grind up a ton of alfalfa. Um, organic alfalfa and alfalfa is a type of legume like a clover mm -hmm. and so it also has a ton of pigment in it and grass so even when they go and, and peck at their uh, non-gmo feed mix they're actually getting eating a ton more grass in that as well and so that's one way we do that and so no matter if they're out and about or inside they're always getting a, um, just a tremendous amount of forage in their diet and that forage they're passing along a ton of nutrients and that coloration too mm -hmm. and so that's super neat between pork chicken and cows yep Usually people would associate chicken with being like in the grocery stores, like, oh, chicken's the health food. Would you, out of all those three animals, which one would you rank being the healthiest, nutritionally speaking, food? Or is it different because you guys aren't doing like traditional, conventional? It does matter. It depends on kind of what you're after in terms of what nutrients. The eggs have some things that you really can't hardly find in anything else. The beef is going to be the most nutrient dense per like ounce of product. And that's because they go through a full grass finishing process of two years and they are packing down um, basically all the phytonutrients, all kinds of micronutrients from our really healthy pastures. And they're storing that in their bodies for two years before they're harvesting. We harvest them at the peak. So the beef is probably going to be the most nutrient rich, but you're going to be able to see a tremendous difference, feel, taste, see a tremendous difference in any of the products just because of the diversity of their diet you know garbage in garbage out when they're being raised on healthy soils and eating plants that are pulling nutrients out of healthy soils and they're packing that in themselves so they experience that health and then when we harvest them we too experience that mm -hmm. so you know if if you grow a chicken on waste grease and um, you know gmo grain yeah it, it's gonna be pretty lacking you know if you if you grow a, a feedlot steer um, and all he eats his entire life is um corn and spoiled oats dressing, you know, and, and I'm not kidding about that. Most beef animals, when they are harvested, are dying of organ failure, particularly their livers. They, they simply would not live longer um, because they're, they're inducing obesity, basically, and fatty liver disease and all kinds of stuff. On ours, I mean, we harvest them at the peak, the moment where they've got the most nutrients and also the best flavor. Is right around two years to two and a half years but biologically they could live another 30. it wouldn't taste as good because the meat starts to get a uh, toughen and they don't really put on additional nutrients that's kind of the peak but uh, just in terms of nutrient density of the food and that you know when they're eating good things in then good things are passed along when it's garbage in you know yeah I, you know i think we wouldn't feel too good if all we ate was gmo corn and spoiled lots dressing i don't know about you but that that sounds like a tough I haven't I haven't seen the YouTube video with that as the new health food trend yep. and for good reason I think yep. you know we get a lot of questions sometimes like when people buy our meat they're like well I opened it up and it's not red why isn't it red uh, and the reason is is because the only way to keep it red is is they pump gases into the packaging that artificially create a red color so the meat naturally is never that red when you cut it and it's first exposed to oxygen momentarily it will bloom it's called it'll redden up just a little bit and then it'll instantly um, start to brown out unless you pump gases into the packaging for about 10 minutes and artificially create this like red pinkish color so we get that question a lot and it's like they're like your meat's not fresh because it's brown it's like well actually it's way fresher our meat 
is brown because five minutes later it, it turns to that brown color and then we flash freeze it. So you're like eating meat that's like metabolic, like five minutes old versus a, that red fresh meat in the grocery store might be a month old and it's sat like that, but they're using artificial gases uh, in that packaging to create a color that's completely unnatural. Um, Wow. Yeah, so that's kind of an intriguing thing, like on. So how would people stuff. know if that's? Is there anything on a package that someone? Oh would... no, they don't have to declare it. If your packaged meat looks bright red, then it is it is filled with artificial gases to create that. It doesn't meat doesn't look like that, but like no one knows that. Looks bright red and juicy, but this piece of meat is not safe to eat. Believe it or not, it's been sitting out for 11 days. So how could it still look so fresh? It's because it's being packed and gassed in a special process that most people never heard about, using carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, which keeps the meat looking fresh and bright red. We left two cuts of lamb out at room temperature. One was gas packed, the other, no gas. After a few days, the untreated meat turns a dark, unappealing color. But the gas packed meat stays red, even after being left out for eight days. The only visible sign of spoilage is the package puffing out and a bad odor when opened. We had the meat analyzed in a lab, and it's no surprise that both cuts are loaded with bacteria. The color of the meat doesn't necessarily indicate wow. it's fresh. Even cases at the grocery store, like your fresh slice stuff, they pump that gas in the case to hold that stuff that color. Holy moly. Yep. Because even like we were talking about your eggs earlier, that your egg yolks are more orange. And I've heard that other farmers, they can use marigold to make the yolks more mm -hmm. orange. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking maybe with the cows, they were feeding the cows something that oh, made it to, more to red. Oh, to pigment it more red. Nope, it's uh, gases. And I, I've seen different packaging where they put things like potato starch or other fillers in there. I don't know if it's to actually fill it up to make it heavier or if it's because it's just going to preserve it and keep it longer sometimes it's preservatives you know they depending on what the product is there can be all kinds of things put in there to preserve fresh uh shelf life because that's at the end of the day that's what the commodity industry is trying to figure out is just how can we make this last as long as possible on the shelf which typically means how can we kill this thing or pump it full of artificial things because things that are like things that have life, when they die, they decompose. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually what's supposed to happen. And so the, their goal is to how to take things and like strip all the life out of it or add artificial things in that prevent that decomposition, which isn't all that great when you then subsequently eat it. Um, right? Because then you're filling yourself with things that are supposed to prevent decomposition. And you are a living organism that typically doesn't need that. You know, infamously, now this is not any, this has been done away with, but uh, there was a time where they put formaldehyde in milk because it uh formaldehyde is an embalming agent it's what they put in bodies so they don't decompose okay yeah <laughs> it does make the shelf life of milk tremendously longer so why don't you pasteurize your milk because that is the newer thing to do to keep the shelf life yeah yep yep pasteurization keeps the shelf life long uh the re one of the reasons that we don't and the main one is is like the milk as long as it's produced in a clean environment and the cows are eating grass um the pH of their bloodstream is completely different and the, the quality of the milk is different and that milk is actually biologically active and it has the enzymes in it that allow your body to digest it. And so you get way more out of it. However, from the confinement dairy standpoint of things, those animals don't get any grass. They're eating grain and all kinds of other mixes. It changes the pH in the cow and it actually dramatically increases the bacteria levels in the milk. And then you get some really nasty stuff in there. And so their solution was, is, oh, if we boil it, we kill everything. And then, then it's fine. Well, uh, there's some real downsides to that. Like it's, it's inert, it's dead. Your body doesn't have a way to digest it. And uh, so you're killing all the, the good things in it. They have to, because if you just drink that raw, then it, it would be pathologically dangerous. Mm. But on our animals eating grass, their body's pH is different. They don't have those bacterial strains. In fact, what they have is cultured bacteria. It's good, like what you'd have in yogurt and things. So it's actually great for you. And so that's the reason that we don't. Though interestingly enough, with milk going bad or preserving shelf life, our milk has a much longer shelf life than pasteurized milk because our milk does not actually sour. Conventional milk, when you, know, you pop the lid and you hit it, and you're like, oh, you know, it, it, when it's bad, it is bad pasteurized milk. And the reason is because the, what finally grew back in there are really nasty bacteria and it makes an awful smell and mm -hmm. it's telling your body don't drink this. Our milk actually just um, 
becomes kefir. Yeah, it becomes kefir. It just okay. ages. So it starts going through a fermentation process. And so it's just turning into, first it goes some milk, and then it's going into kefir, and then more of a yogurt form, and then eventually a cheese form. So all the way along, we have people reach out and say, hey, how long is it good for? And it's like, well, actually... Um, you know, eventually it'll turn into cheese, but you know, it's not going to go bad, right? Oh, wow. As long as you keep it at the right temperature. So our milk actually lasts longer than pasteurized milk, uh, but it's just going to, to be doing that fermentation process as it ages. And then with cows, people have this fear that cows are taking a lot of water. They use 10 bathtubs full of water. Their cow burps or cow farts, all the carbon that's put into the air mm -hmm. and that they take a lot of land. Mm -hmm. That's a, a whole lot of questions, but what we're taking really quick is, as we've got to see part of our farm and, and taking you around, I think it, it matters how it's done. So there is a way that cattle can be extremely um, derogatory to the land and can be really destructive. But there's also a way to manage cattle where they can be incredibly beneficial to the land and actually regenerate a landscape. And so when we manage cattle with regenerative agriculture, they're actually the single best way to sequester carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. Because by grazing off our plants and bringing the animals in, we're managing a solar panel. Our grass is a solar panel. It needs to be green and growing so it can capture sunlight and pull carbon from the air and put it into its roots. But those plants will stop doing that if they get too tall or if they get too short. And so what we do with our cows is they come in, they graze those plants off, so they reset it, they prune that solar panel so it doesn't get too tall, and then they leave and it rests. And that graze, rest, recovery is actually a cycle of pulling carbon from the air into the plant roots, and then when those plants get grazed, they actually release that carbon into the soil and in turn pick up water and other minerals from soil microbiological activity because our soils are living and alive instead of dead and sterilized. And so that cycle actually builds health and year after year we're pulling more carbon from the atmosphere, putting it into our soil which then produces more healthy soil which then produces more grass which then allows us to graze and produce more cattle. Seventy percent of the earth's land is land that is not suitable for tillage, which is to say you it's uh, inerable, it's just mm -hmm. grassland, and you can't do anything else with it. And so if you just say, well, we're not, we're not going to do cattle anymore or any grazing livestock, you've completely given up the ability to produce food on that acreage, and you've lost your single best tool to actually restore that land. There are groups out there that have done these same principles in the desert and transformed completely desert landscapes into something that looks like just beautiful and lush. It's, it's incredible. Cattle can be a tool to heal that. And in terms of water and addressing that, they do drink a lot of water. However, they're drinking that water and then they're spreading it out on the fields as they graze. That water then filters down through the healthy soil and returns to those same aquifers. And it actually is a system that helps um, increase soil life and activity because the cows, by drinking that water and then spreading that water on the fields, are actually like continually watering the fields and they're not as reliant on rainwater. And so that cycle actually builds health and builds ecology deep into the soil. And there's no net loss of water in that system because it's a closed system as they're grazing and moving along. Um, even methane, you know, people say, well, they, you know, they burp and they release methane and it's greenhouse gas. Uh, here in the last few years has actually discovered that in healthy regenerative grazed soil that is biologically living and active, there are microbes that are present nowhere else, which is to say you can't find them just to take a, a sample of soil from a GMO crop field or a poorly grazed um, field. But if you take a field that's been regeneratively grazed with cattle for several years, that soil has microbes in it that break down methane. They didn't think mm -hmm. there was a microbe that could handle methane. As it turns out, they do. And when they measure the total amount of them, it turns out that the microbes in that soil that support, say, 100 cows are actually capable of breaking down the methane from way more than 100 cows. So they're actually, <laughs> it's a methane sink, just nobody knew it. And it's all how you take care of it in management. They can be a tool of destruction or they can be a tool of life. Mm -hmm. It really just comes down to how you care for them. So manage it in a regenerative way and they can bring life and provide extremely nutrient rich food to a tremendous number of people. Manage them in a poor way uh, as a poor steward and they can bring trauma to the land and wastewater um, and all kinds of diseases and issues. It's just a matter of how we care for it. When you talk about a life then there's people who will say well a cow is a life and so you're taking a life mm -hmm. but the I mean how much meat does one cow provide because I feel like it could help give so many lives because I'm sure you've heard about beyond burgers, plant-based burgers, um, eating crickets and bugs and mm -hmm. insects. And so there's a big push towards getting away from eating meat because yes. meat's unhealthy. It's bad for the environment and animal welfare is also a topic. Why do you think that there's such a push towards getting rid of meat? 
That's a great question. I think a lot of it is good hearted, but um, misdirected. Um, in okay, terms good, because I'm a conspiracy theorist, I guess, because I was like, hmm, well, if they're trying to make people sick over here, so. <laughs> well, well, I said most of it. You, you wouldn't know. I didn't say all of it. One big thing, uh, you know, Beyond Meat and all this, I'm not picking on just them, but all of those, their, their system relies on getting ingredients from genetically modified corn and soybean fields. Those fields, the soil is dead in that area. So the water cycle is broken. They require artificial chemical fertilizers to be put on, which then subsequently erode off and get in the groundwater. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to places in Iowa where you can't drink the water, it'll turn children blue because it bind, because it's so filled with nitrates from uh, crop field erosion that it'll bind all the oxygen in a baby and it'll turn them blue and they'll suffocate um, from drinking water. Wow. So that's horrible. Um, that's groundwater pollution. Their system, the, gre the core ingredients from those <laughs> Beyond Meat products have to be sustained by that system it's horribly broken it picturesquely can look better because you know they can show like kind of green growing fields of corn and soybeans and be like hey you know we we do a good job doesn't this look nice and yes it looks better than a picture of poorly managed cattle you know knee deep in manure but that's not the only way to do cattle and it's not the only way to care for land and that man that method of caring for land is actually the quickest way of destroying land it sterilizes the life in the soil and it is eroding away our topsoil um, and our main areas that grow those corn and soybeans those genetically modified corn and soybeans we've lost feet of topsoil mm -hmm. there isn't feet more of topsoil to go and as they're losing that they're then more chemically dependent on chemical inputs and that's where you get into maybe some of the nefarious side of things is, is the people selling those products and, and building these systems know that once you go that route it's really hard to get off of that route you're stuck right if you take good healthy soil and you start using all their chemicals and and their process is you'll get an initial yield bump. It'll produce a little bit more. And the reason is, is all those chemicals kill all the life. And that life then decomposes mm -hmm. and gives extra nutrients to the crops or whatever it is. And so you get this little bump. And so for a year or two, it seems great. But then you've bit the, you've taken the pill, you, the poison, and then your life's dead and you can't get away from those chemicals or those things, or it's extremely difficult to, because you go back and your soil's dead and inert and it can't grow things the biological way anymore. It needs those inputs mm -hmm. and those dollars to go to those companies. And so, uh, no. Uh, well, and I'm sure they're more prof profitable doing that. Oh, thing. tremendous, especially the agro companies are a lot more profitable doing that. The farmer's kind of caught in the middle. It's better for just a, a short, better, maybe on a, on a bottom line financial statement for a year or two, but then they're trapped and they can't make a pivot out of it. And it's really mm -hmm. kind of a sad, state of affairs um, but no if we if we go down this road of completely moving away from from animal agriculture and animals being able to heal and restore the land a cow or a sheep or a grazing rumen is, is really the only animal that we can take on those vast grasslands to restore them and sink that carbon and so if we just move away from that we've lost our best tool at actually stopping um, carbon going into the atmosphere and actually reversing the degradation cycle that's present um, in most of our agrarian lands today and so in terms of, you know, taking the life as a cow, a life, absolutely. Is a sheep a life? Absolutely. Is there more life than I could even fathom just underneath my feet in the soil right now? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think as a culture, we've, we've stepped away from that because we've lost our connection with life. We, one of two things, either we're so we're passe with life, which is we don't value it at all. Um, because we've lost our connection with it because most people have and, or we overvalue it to the point that we, we, real, we forget that our entire system and the way the earth functions is life begetting life, mm -hmm. right? You know, the microbes in the soil are dying and giving life to the plant roots, which then give nutrients back to more microbes that then reproduce from that. In the same way, there's a, you know, a, a sacrosanct relationship, you know, with our livestock and animals in that we're caring for them, we're protecting them, we're giving them a life that they could never experience in the wild in terms of protection from predators and all those things. In turn, we are shepherding and guiding them across our landscapes to heal and restore it, to bring life to soil, to bring life to plants, to bring life to an increasing number of those livestock and to then pr provide life through that sacrifice for a tremendous number of people. So it's life begetting life begetting life as a culture, we've just completely disconnected from that. And so I think then we blindly rush into things and a desire to help. And we actually make things so much worse, uh, which is really tragic. Or we, we pursue paths that will lead to a tremendous amount of death. Like the Beyond Meat things, you have, you're eating something that in some cases was never alive because this was completely chemically engineered. In other cases, it was, you know, corn or soybeans, but that production system is actually creating death in the soil. 
and in the wildlife and everything, or even the farmers that partake of it. I, I know several farmers now that um, they were getting sick. You know, they've grown up in ag their whole lives, and they were big row crop farmers doing everything right. And they, they were just undiagnosably ill, and they couldn't figure out various ones that got connected with doctors. And, and they just told them, like, you have to stop exposing yourself to these chemicals or you will die. Mm. As a 30-year-old guy with a family, you are going to kill yourself doing this. One guy, just a neat, neat story, and they said, wow, this is going to be an incredible change. But they converted their entire row crop operation that was just dead soil, dead plants, and about to be dead people because it was killing them because their bodies were more sensitive to those chemicals than some. It's not that those chemicals are great for everyone. It's just that some bodies are way more sensitive to it, and they were, and it was physically going to kill them. They transformed that. They're a regenerative farm, deep soil, healthy plants, healthy animals being shepherded across that, and, and you know his health is restored, and life has been restored to that little piece of uh, American farmland, and that's our vision and our hope for all of this farmland across our nation and the world is, is if... Um, we all start practicing regenerative agriculture, we would be a tremendous increase in life, tremendous increase in the nutrient density of the food that families receive, which would then help them. It would be an increase in their health and, and bring life. And so I think it's uh, important for us to remember that. Do you think that it would be sustainable for everyone in the U.S. to be able to eat regenerative Oh, you know, if everyone tried to do it tomorrow, it would it would wreck everything. It's kind okay. of like Dave Ramsey when he says, you know, if, if everyone gave up debt tomorrow, the economy would crash. If we do it systematically, then we build a, a brand new system for our economy to work on. Okay. Same with our food system. Um, can regenerative agriculture feed the world? The answer is yes, and it can do it tremendously. Well, we can produce more edible food per acre here than you can on a row crop farm. And, you know, the scientists like to compare it on a caloric basis. Mm -hmm. But years into this now, we can, we can out-raise food on a caloric basis on our regenerative farm. And what they don't compare even, and so we can outdo it on a caloric basis, but then when you get on a nutrient by nutrient mm -hmm. basis, you would die of all kinds of horrific uh, nutrient deficiency diseases if you tried to make your sole diet corn. But on our farm, that those total calories are coming from so many diverse different things and filled and packed with nutrients uh, that, that you would live about the, the best, most fullest life your body could possibly do because you're fueled up with those things. So can regenerative agriculture feed the country? Absolutely, it can feed the world. And it's really the only thing that has hope to do so because each and every year, that life and that new soil that we're building then grows new plants additional plants, more plants and biomass than we had the year prior. Even in a drought, you know, we're looking around our farm today and we got to tour everything. And, uh, you know, we're walking through grass that's a foot tall, eight foot tall in places. And we have life in our soil. We have moisture in our soils, um, in our farm, and we're able to produce grass even in a drought. It builds a resiliency to things. And each and every year, that increases. And our ability to produce more nutrient-rich food increases. Mm -hmm. On the conventional side of things, it's actually the opposite. Each and every year, those dead fields... Um, require more chemical fertilizer. They require more weed killing agents because weeds keep trying to grow and develop and more topsoil erodes away into either the ocean, the rivers, or our aquifers, which mm -hmm. then poison all of the above. Mm -hmm. And so that system is actually slipping away each and every year. It becomes less and less viable. On a regenerative system, each and every year it becomes more viable because that life begets more life. I think sometimes people think that it's too expensive mm -hmm. to buy lo from local farmers you know, I used to eat more of a processed food diet and it was very cheap, mm -hmm. but I was getting sick three, four times a year. So I'm calling off of work, not making money there. Then mm -hmm. I'm also having to pay for medications and hospital bills and I'm young. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. wait until I'm older and all the things that would have happened where I'm spending money mm -hmm. and all those more processed foods too, they don't really fill you up. So you're like, oh, it was only a dollar for my macaroni and cheese. Yeah. But then it, now I need to have more Doritos chips because that didn't fill me up. And so it's like, it, mm -hmm. you are spending more money, but then when on paper I look, oh wow, beef, that's pretty expensive. So mm -hmm. I can't afford that. So I think that the idea of supporting local or eating more meat turns yeah. people off just from even cost factor. Maybe they're like, hey, I like meat, I like nutrients, but I can't afford it. Oh, absolutely. And you know, there's no doubt that just on a, on a sticker level, you can say it's more expensive, but when you look at like the holistic picture of your life, how you feel, the energy levels you have, your own health, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a trade. I don't think many people, if they thought of all those factors and be like, would I trade, you know, my health, my energy level, um, and my Having ability children. to, my ability to have children. Yeah. Health abilities, um, you know, energy levels, family. Would I trade all that for 300 bucks a month? I don't think many people would. 
-hmm. right? You know, and they look at that, but they don't compare. They're just trying to say apples to apples, and it's not apples to apples at all. You're shortchanging yourself. You're shortchanging your own health, maybe your ability to have a family, your energy levels. You're shorting yourself on all those things to save a couple dollars, and you're participating in a system that is, is winding down versus, yeah, you might spend more money on the front end, but you're investing in yourself, you're investing in your health, you're investing in your family, and you're investing in the legacy that you're leaving, which is to say you're helping to establish and see the, the promulgation of regenerative farms that are then building soil that are growing plants and animals that will nourish a generation that you might never see, but you get to be a part of something bigger than that while investing in yourself. And to me, that's a win-win. Yep. David and I got married and we were told very quickly that we probably would not be able to have children or that it would be very difficult and we're given a list of medications to try if we wanted to. And that just didn't sound like a good idea. It didn't sound um, good for me to just take medications every day or whatever. Um, it wasn't financially tenable. Yeah, either. yeah, we just couldn't do that. Didn't feel right about it. And so anyway, I grew up on a very a horrific diet. Um, you know, everything came from a box or a can. So we just decided, you know what, how about we just try to help me be healthier because I had other health issues just aside from that. Um, that I've struggled with for years that I just thought was normal and really it was just my diet causing all of those issues. So anyway, we decided, you know, well, let's just go find something, you know, healthier at the grocery store and it was expensive. We were newly married and in college we didn't have money to spend on food. Like if we didn't truly know that it was the best and they're like, I don't know, like, are this, is this farm really doing what they say they're doing? If I'm going to spend this extra money. So we just decided to do it ourselves. So we truly knew that if I was going to change my health and my diet and our ability to have children, that we would just raise it ourselves. And so anyway, just slowly, we kind of started changing how I ate. And within six to eight months, we were pregnant with our first child. And we thought, gosh, if we could change our health, we would love to be able to help other people with their health also. So it just kind of started that way. And it's just taken off. And so, yeah. And some people think that when they, to change their health, that they have to go to these extremes of I need to go hardcore vegan or hardcore carnivore mm -hmm. and it seems overwhelming and there's all these rules they have to follow. Was it for you just more simple, hey, I'm not gonna have processed foods, I'm just gonna eat real whole foods and that's what you saw the change or what was the what was your diet back Well, then? at first it was like, oh my gosh, I have to change everything. And now David's like, no, just take it one at a time. And so I think um, our meat and eggs was like the first thing that I changed and then, you know, just slowly took out other things. We tried and to get rid of bodies boxed foods. Yeah. It's like we went through our pantry and it's like, well, we're just going to pitch this or pitch that. And it's like, well, what are we going to buy instead? And we're like, well, I don't know. We're going to figure out something that's, uh, you know, better for us that we're going to replace it with. And we just did it systematically. Yeah. And so that I don't made know that it... we saw a tremendous benefit until we got decently far Farther into that in. transformation, but it was a, a stepping stone for us. Yeah. Cause it is overwhelming to think, well, I have to completely change everything now. And that would cost so much money. I have all this food in my pantry now. Like for us, we just took it a little bit slower, like a little bit at a time, started to see benefits from that and then just kept going. And then that excites you and it makes it not seem so overwhelming or terrifying or scary because you've already seen changes happening and helping you increase um, your health and all of that. So we just took it little by little. I think meat and eggs was the first thing. And then um, by the time our son was born, we had switched milk and dairy products. And so... And cut most of the carbs out. Yeah. And... So you guys eat a low-carb diet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not, not because you're trying to, just because, hey, I want to eat these nutrient-rich foods and they just so happen to be lower carb. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we went uh, really hardcore for a while mm -hmm. there and just completely cut virtually all carbs everything out, out unless you can you know consider the carbohydrate level of spinach you know it's, it's pretty minimal and yeah. uh, so we did that um for time for some deep cleanses mm -hmm. a few yep. times um when we were really trying to get things uh, rocked but our current balance is is there some but it's all in moderation yeah um and that makes a tremendous difference yeah all right, you guys, I intentionally wanted to make sure this video was not sponsored because I think sometimes people interpret sponsorships to being less authentic. And I want what I'm going to say to be heard because I mean what I'm going to say from the bottom of my heart. I'm so grateful to know exactly where my food is coming from. And I couldn't encourage that more for you. I think for hundreds and thousands of years, people had a garden or their own animals or they knew their farmer. Whereas nowadays, 
people don't really know where their food's coming from and they don't know where their money is going and who they're supporting. I remember when my husband and I first heard about buying from local farmers and we thought the idea of buying from a farmer sounded nice, but it sounds complicated, but it sounds expensive, but it sounds like a lot of time researching and trying to figure out how all that works. But, 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 we were full of buts. And I'd encourage you to throw out your butts. This is exactly how we found our local farmer. We went onto the website called realmilk.com. I know eatwild.com is a similar website, so both of those are options, where you just type in your zip code and it'll populate all of the local farmers in your neighborhood. Now with that said, you might live in the city. You're like, I do not live near a farm. And I don't either. So fed from the farm is actually a three hour drive away from where I live but David offers a free delivery service all over the state of Missouri. So I just order my food online and then one day of the week, I pick up my food in a neighborhood near me. So you might find a farm that's near you where you can pick up the food or in your state, you might have a similar farmer who does a delivery service where you can pick up your food in a neighborhood near you for free or I know there's plenty of farmers across the US that do ship their food. Even Fed From The Farm, he can ship out of state, he just can't sell the dairy. <laughs> I'll link Fed From The Farm's website in the description. Otherwise, I hope you find a farmer in your area who you can support and where you can know where the food's coming from. Don't be silly, subscribe to Lily, and I'll see you in the next one.